Good morning. This is Dr. Nick Tula with my Saturday morning live stream. Thank you so much if you're tuning in live. I see there's like eight people or nine people watching. That's fantastic. Um, and if you want to say hi, uh, I'd love to hear from you. You could use the chat on the side. And I hope that my audio sync problems have been solved. Let me tell you something. These live streams are not exactly easy. I should do a live stream on how to do a live stream because um, I've been working uh, for three hours this morning just to make sure everything's working properly, to get all my graphics done, to like look up the patient and everything. So uh, it's, um, it's a bit of a challenge, but it's great when everything works fine. Anyway, for those of you who are just tuning in for the first time, I'm Dr. Nick Tulo. I'm a cardiac electrophysiologist. So I live in the world of arrhythmias and ECGs. And I've been teaching people how to read an ECG for decades. I mean, I've been practicing almost 35 years now, and I really enjoy empowering people and getting people to understand ECGs like I do from a physiologic standpoint. Unfortunately, there are a lot of people who picked up an ECG book and they are just sort of um, functioning with the bare basic knowledge. A lot of telemetry nurses and techs and um, even a lot of interns and residents were not really well prepared to be able to read ECGs independently. So uh, my, my job here is to guide you and, and help you become um, an expert in reading ECGs by showing you how an ECG expert like myself looks at these tracings and tries to analyze it and figure it out from the standpoint of what is the heart doing? What is the electrical system uh, doing? How, to, how can we tell from the outside? And, th and in order to be able to do that, you have to be able to understand the physiology. That's why I, in my course online at ecgacademy.com, I start from the basics with physiology. So I see a lot of people are tuning in. Good morning to everybody who is there. Uh, Leonardo and Brian and Rama, Ramana Kumar, thank you very much. Um, and uh, Dorian, thanks for tuning in. If you guys have questions or something, I'll kind of glance over. Hi, Jolly. <laughs> Jolly's wonderful. Uh, I work with her and uh, I'm happy to see you uh, tuning in. Anyway, these live streams are kind of off the cuff and they're, they're unrehearsed. So uh, let's get to the case presentation and Jolly might know who I'm talking about. Anyway, this, this actually is a very interesting lady, 86 year old woman, and she is just the sweetest thing. Y'all cannot get out of her room without giving her a big old hug, you know, cause she wants her hugs. Um, anyway, back in February, she had presented to um, one of my partners with complaints of feeling her heart racing and getting lightheaded. And she even actually fell over and passed out a couple of times. And uh, this was a serious problem. Uh, prior to that, she'd been very healthy. Uh, she had a history of hypertension. She was on some Coreg and um, she was doing well. She actually had echocardiograms in the past that showed normal ventricular function. Never had a problem with coronary disease. And now all of a sudden she started having symptoms of dizziness and lightheadedness and feeling presyncopal with the sense of rapid palpitations. And she said even uh, she could lie down in bed and feel her heart racing. So they hooked her up to a Holter monitor. And uh, let me just uh, share that with you. So now I'm going to head over to my Photoshop screen here. And OK, so this is a 24 hour trend of her heart rates with the heart rates here on the left side and uh, 1 p.m. all the way till the following afternoon. And what you see on the trend is something very interesting is like at during the day, her heart rate is kind of like all over the place. It goes as high as 145 or 150 beats a minute, um, down as low as uh, 50 or 45. And I mean, it, it, it just seems to be all over the place. At night, she kind of settles down and averages a heart rate at, you know, around 70 or 80. But the next morning gets up and, and there it goes again. So if we look at some of these tracings, let's uh, bring up the first tracing here. Um, so this is just a sort of a random tracing that I came up with. And um, it uh, shows uh, somewhat of a sinus bradycardia uh, on this side of the tracing with rates in the 50s. 
and then uh, speeds up and slows down. And then you have what here is um, kind of what looks like a, a rapid run, irregular, irregularly irregular, kind of sort of in the range of about 100 beats a minute or so. And then look, when that breaks, you've got this long pause before the first sinus beat kicks in right here. So for those of you who understand the way the sinus node works, it fires on a regular basis, but if, if, if some other area in the atrium starts firing faster than the sinus node, the sinus node function gets suppressed. So there's always a degree of something what we call overdrive suppression. And sometimes that overdrive suppression can become exaggerated when somebody has a degree of sick sinus syndrome. Of course, this lady was on Coreg, so that suppresses your sinus node already because it's, after all, a beta blocker. So she's having runs of fast beats and runs of slow beats. And um, she was told that she had tachybrady syndrome. Here, let's show you a couple more runs. Um, look at look at how rapidly this and how long these runs are and if you look at the at the wide strip down here you can see she'll she has a burst and then a slow beats and then a burst and a very slow beats and fast and slow and all over the place so she was told she had this very interesting uh, 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 diagnosis of tachycardia bradycardia syndrome here's one more that I showed that I want to show you. So she's got fast beats. And then here, look at this. This pause is so long that it looks like she has an idioventricular escape beat and another one here. So she was told she had tachybrady syndrome and that she needed a pacemaker because in order to treat the fast heartbeats, you need to be able to basically protect her against having slow heartbeats. So, um, so tachybrady syndrome is a very common diagnosis, in, especially in older people, because they have underlying sinus node dysfunction and they have these atrial arrhythmias that are maybe paroxysmal. And, um, and so sometimes you use a pacemaker to control the slow beats and you use medications to control the fast beats. But she wasn't going to have it. You know, she just didn't want a pacemaker. She was like, well, what, what else can you do? Uh, and her, the cardiologist kind of like, threw up his hands and said, look, if you want a second opinion, go ahead. So she went to another cardiologist and he did a Holter monitor as well. And he was so concerned that she was having paroxysmal atrial fibrillation that he put her on uh, anticoagulation. He put her on Eliquis. So now she's walking around on Eliquis and they actually cut down on the core egg because they were afraid that she was having fainting spells because she was getting Brady, but she kept having these rapid heartbeats. And so the other cardiologist said, look, you need a pacemaker. And she was like, mm, well, isn't there something else we can do? So eventually she came to see me. And uh, at that point, she's um, still having symptoms of presyncope, palpitations, lightheadedness, and so forth. And I ran an ECG in my office. And here it is. Let me show it to you. Okay, so same fast and slow and all that. And um, hold on, let me make sure I'm drawing on the right layer. So um, if you were looking at this ECG, you would uh, say, well, you've got some very uh, slow beats and the P waves are upright in one and two. So we have a very profound sinus Brady. And then she has like a whole run, irregularly irregular beats in here. So she has some kind of atrial tachyarrhythmia. Okay, but you have to look more carefully and, and, and just so don't kind of look at the, the forest. Now it's time to look at the trees and see what, what we see. So this first beat here, let, we'll take a look at V1 because V1 is a good place to look at uh, P waves, isn't it? So this sinus Brady beat has a sort of a normal looking P wave for V1, but look at this beat here. Isn't it kind of weird? It now has uh, two downgoing bumps. And when you look at lead three, it again is sort of a bifid. So this isn't really a sinus beat. Now the next beat over here has a similar P wave morphology with sort of a double bump here going down in V1 and going up in the inferior leads. But what do we see after that? Let's look carefully. 
does this look like atrial fibrillation? Because if you're going to call this a P wave, it looks like there's another one like this right there. And then it looks like there's another one of the same morphology and then here and then here. And so do you see what I'm saying? It's, this is not a disorganized arrhythmia. This is not irregularly, it may be irregularly irregular in the ventricle, but the atrial rate is really quite constant here at a rate of roughly about 140 beats per minute. It's a little less than two big boxes. Um, and, and you can see these organized P waves in multiple leads here and here and here and here, and it's marching on through. And so what you have here, in fact, is not atrial fibrillation, is not atrial flutter. What you have is atrial tachycardia. It's sort of like, if you want to call it PAT, you can call it PAT. Good morning, Zahra. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. It, it's atrial tachycardia. Right? So it's not disorganized and it's not fast enough to call it flutter. So let's see what else we have. So here's another, this is a, just a continuous strip in my office. She's sitting there. And that's, this is what we see. This is what the, the other cardiologists had called atrial fibrillation. It's not. So here you have these sort of slow beats here. And then, and she's off, and here in lead two, we have this upright atrial signal which is steady and regular, and it's, what, it's, well, we have wiki back, right? So the PR is here, and then it gets a little longer, and then a little longer, longer, and this one looks like it blocks, and then it gets shorter again. So this is actually maybe a sinus beat here, and then this sinus beat, clearly the P wave looks different, but, but, but look at, now it's back, this bifid P wave is back again. So it almost looks like you have the sinus node in one spot, and this, ectopic focus in another spot that's firing and it's firing again and again and again. So, um, so this was happening constantly. I mean, it, when you look at, uh, the, um, one of these other here, this, this strip down here at the bottom, this is, this is like incessant all day long and she's having this rapid beat. So, well, um, when, when we talk about atrial arrhythmias like this, atrial tachycardia in particular, you know, let's, let's get back to the anatomy a little bit. Okay, so here is my little illustration of the inside of the heart with your, let me pick a lighter color, your sinus node here up at the top. And um, this, of course, sends out electrical signals that get into this AB node and then to the ventricle. So we know about that. But atrial arrhythmias come in a a couple of different versions, and it all has to do with the mechanism of the arrhythmia. And in broad categories in arrhythmias, you have disorders of impulse generation and disorders of impulse conduction. So th the difference is in disorders of impulse generation, the electrical impulses are being generated by a focal point in the myocardium that's firing abnormally. Whereas disorders of impulse conduction occur because of abnormal conduction, that's when the um, uh, arrhythmia is sort of like stuck going round and round in a circle. We call that reentry. So reentry is usually perfectly regular, and then when it breaks, it breaks. It's usually induced by a premature beat that gets stuck into a reentry circuit, and then when it breaks, it breaks, and you're back in sinus rhythm for long periods of time. So and that may go on for minutes or hours, even days, you can have this electrical signal that's stuck in a circus movement going round and round. On the other hand, that's not what's happening here. What's happening here is you have bursts, salvos, rapid rhythms that start and stop and start and stop and start and stop. Okay, so that behaves much more like a disorder of impulse generation. These impulses are being generated by an ectopic focus. So really the best thing to call it is an ectopic atrial tachycardia. Now, where do these ectopic atrial tachycardias come from? Well, we don't really know, but obviously it's an, a physiologic disturbance in a very small area of the atrial myocardium. So in her case, where could it be? I mean, when you look at her ECG, let me just, um, here, 
So let's look at all the P waves to kind of get a better sense of, you know, where this could be coming from. So in, um, <clears throat> if this is a sinus beat, because it looks clearly different than all the others, it's, it's up in one, but the ectopic focus is, is up in one as well. It's up in two, and it's sort of like mm, isoelectric in three here. Um, it's up in AVL. And in this case, the tachycardia is sort of up in AVL. So the axis is very similar. It's heading down towards the feet and kind of towards the patient's left. And when you look at V1 and, and, and even v, V4, V5, V6, the P waves during tachycardia were very similar, but a little different because they had this double bump. Okay. So when we go back to the heart, the, the internal view here, where could this be coming from? Well, you know, there is a specific um, arrhythmia known as sinoatrial reentry tachycardia. And, uh, and that has to do with the fact that sometimes the sinus node, which is calcium dependent, can have perhaps these um, extensions and you may have reentry down one and back up the other and you may have a local reentry coming from the sinus node and it seems to start and stop, but the P waves look identical to the sinus node. In this case, they don't look identical. So this is not sinoatrial reentry tachycardia. It's an ectopic atrial focus coming from the high right atrium someplace. Now, what do you think that double bump means? It means that it's taking a long time to get from the right atrium to the left atrium because you have like a very broad P wave. And one of the most common places for ectopic atrial tachycardia to arise from is the crista terminalis. Now, that's sort of an advanced topic. How many people know what the crista terminalis is? Raise your hand. Ah, I see you. You know it. That's great. <laughs> it's kind of silly. I'm talking to a little camera on top of my computer. Or like, I, I think I'm, people think I'm crazy now. Okay, but anyway, so the crista terminalis is an interesting anatomical structure in the right atrium. <clears throat> and it basically comes from the fact that Great, drop my pen. It comes from an embryologic uh, event where um, two um, basically planes of tissue, two basically planes of cells um, wind up fusing together and very gradually forming a, the, the right atrial free wall. So where the two planes come together, it creates a line, kind of a line in the sand. Uh, anyway. The crista terminalis is actually located, where's my pen? Okay, it's located here. And it, it runs from the superior vena cava to the inferior vena cava. And it actually represents the division between the smooth septal right atrial tissue here. So this is very smooth. And it involves the septum and a little bit of the, of the um, anterior surface. And the lateral trabeculated right atrium here, where there's all these like trabeculated muscle fibers and these bumps and nooks and crannies that make up the lateral wall of the right atrium. So that line right there is, was a line of fusion. And the crazy thing about the crista terminalis <laughs> Jolly got it right. Okay, so the crazy thing about the crista terminalis is not only does it frequently, it's frequently home to some of these ectopic foci that they for some reason arise from the tissue in the region of the crista terminalis. But the crista terminalis is kind of like a, a fibrous knot or, or string through the atrial muscle and it serves as a line of conduction block. So the signals do not easily pass across the crista terminalis. It's often, often to the point where, let me just pick another color, to the point where if a signal arises from this region here, oh, I need something lighter than that. Okay, so if, if a signal arises from up here someplace on the lateral wall, it can't get across the crista. The crista serves as a functional line of block. The signal can get across 
it just takes longer. And sometimes what happens is it has to go up and around the superior vena cava or it has to go around the, uh, the, the uh, tricuspid annulus in order to make its way to the rest of the atrium. And so if you have a, a signal that fires, you have one part of the P wave that represents conduction down that lateral wall. And then the signal has to make its way across the crista to get to Bachmann's bundle and to get to the, the left atrium, and then it goes down the left atrium. So that's why you have a double bump. So guess what? That's where this arrhythmia was arising from. Now, um, as far as treating it, medical therapy can be effective. Um, what is the most common um, mechanism for these kinds of ectopic foci? There are, there are basically two mechanisms. One is abnormal automaticity, and the other is known as triggered activity. And so, like if I go back to our action potential of an atrial, oh, that's just terrible, um, of an atrial myocardial cell, they're actually very short. There's not much of a plateau. Okay? And so you have depolarization phase zero, which is sodium rushing into the cell, and then repolarization. Um, which is phase three, which is potassium rushing out of the cells. But what can happen is calcium disturbances, uh, in particular calcium moving in and out of the sarcoplasmic reticulum inside the cell. We're getting too advanced. I can't spend all Saturday morning talking about the sarcoplasmic reticulum after all. But what can happen is abnormal calcium currents within the cell can result in a second depolarization, something called um, a delayed after depolarization. So the cell, okay, fires a second time. And that's because calcium is released into the cell and makes the inside of the cell more positive and that positivity depolarizes the adjacent cell. And sometimes you can get this repetitive triggered activity that occurs and that is what leads to mo many of these automatic foci firing. So it turns out calcium channel blockers can be very effective in suppressing this. So I did go ahead and put this patient on verapamil. The problem is the verapamil didn't really work. Uh, so we knew that beta blockers didn't work. We know that verapamil didn't work. What's the next step? What's the next choice of antiarrhythmic drugs? Well, the, the best drugs to suppress ectopy and turns out to, in, in some patients, at least some patients, to be the class 1C agents. So we had known that this woman had normal ejection fraction just six months prior when she went to the first cardiologist and went through the whole echo and stress and everything. So I put her on flecainide, which is a class 1C agent. So in the pharmacology, I could do a whole live stream on pharmacology but with class 1C, what you're doing is blocking the sodium channels profoundly. So what happens is sodium channels get blocked and that suppresses phase zero in myocardial cells. But sodium channels are also responsible for depolarization as well during diastole. And so flecainide can be very effective in suppressing ectopic procytes. Great for PVCs, is great for, for PACs. Anyway, we put her on flecainide, and after titrating the dose up from 50 BID, and then I gave her 100 in the morning, 50 in the afternoon. I saw her in the office, and her ECG looked great, but she didn't really feel well. She was short of breath. She wasn't sleeping well. And her, even though her lungs were clear, um, we sent her to the hospital. And then it turns out that she had gained all this weight, and we did an echocardiogram and her ejection fraction is now 30%. So her left ventricular function dropped dramatically. Dek from Somalia, thanks for joining us. So with the use of flaconide in this patient who had incessant atrial tachycardia, she now developed congestive heart failure, systolic heart failure, and we were very concerned that so now what do we do? Uh, so this, this is a woman 
Now, why would her left ventricular function decrease like this? Okay, she didn't have any coronary disease. We didn't uh, repeat the nuclear stress test. On echo, her ejection fraction was like 35%. On the stress test, it was like 40. There was no evidence of coronary disease. She didn't have an MI or anything like that. So what do you think caused her ejection fraction to deteriorate over the course of the last you know, three or four months? Okay, that's, that's the Jeopardy question for today. In the category, heart disease causes, what is, in the form of a question, please. <laughs> come on, you guys, get your, who, how many, uh, anybody can, anybody come up with the answer? Why in this patient with incessant atrial tachycardia would she develop systolic heart failure? Okay, ding, okay. Um, in the form of a question is, what is, Tachycardia-induced cardiomyopathy. So for those of you who have never heard of that before, this is a, a, a cardiomyopathy, a diffuse dif dysfunction of the left ventricle. It was actually first seen in children with incessant atrial tachycardias, like the junctional ectopic tachycardia or WPW. Someone, the kids would present in heart failure with baggy, low ejection fraction systolic heart failure. And they found that if they did an ablation of the tachycardia in the kids, their ejection fractions would recover completely. So this is a known clinical cause of systolic heart failure is incessant tachycardia. So, um, and it, it's not entirely clear what's, what's causing it, but obviously you use up all your ATP, you have ultrastructural changes in the heart, and the muscles, but there's not a lot of fibrosis, so that's why it's reversible. But we presume that her ejection fraction started to drop because of this tachycardia-induced cardiomyopathy. And then, bright me, we put her on flecainide. Flecainide is actually negative inotrope as well as a very effective antiarrhythmic agent. And that probably tipped her over the edge and caused her to start accumulating. She gained about 15 pounds and she had edema and she didn't feel well and was short of breath and exercise intolerance. So we, we brought her in the hospital, we diureased her, she stopped the flecainide. And then sure enough, she started having a million PACs and runs and runs and runs and runs. Okay, so we exhausted beta blockers. She, we, I, we, we could have put a pacemaker in and then pushed the verapamil to higher doses. Uh, we could have used something like amiodarone, uh, which would not suppress her LV function. But the problem is that she would have needed a pacemaker. And she didn't really want a pacemaker. So how do you get rid of uh, an ectopic focus like this? If you have access to an electrophysiologist, uh, he'll tell you, do an ablation. And that's what we did. So we brought this patient to the electrophysiology laboratory. And um, this is what her ECG looked like initially. Uh, so you can see this, although it is very uh, condensed, the paper speed here in this case is really, really slow, but she is having incessant runs of SVT here, atrial tac, PAT. So here and then here, and then she has a couple of very slow sinus beats and then a couple more here. So very obvious it's happening. So then we use a three-dimensional mapping system. And the one we use is Cardo, but there are others. So with the catheter, we can move it all around the atrial myocardium. Not only does it give us a three-dimensional anatomic location, but we can measure the time of the depolarization at the tip of the catheter and compare it with the rest of the heart. And in particular, we use a reference in the coronary sinus. And uh, so I have something to show you here. Um, let's see, is this it? Uh, let's see. Okay, so this is a, this is a picture from the, the Cardo system. And actually, this was the second map because what was happening, very frustrating. When she was awake, she was having incessant tachycardia. And we gave her deep sedation and it kind of stopped. And so we couldn't map it. And every time we woke her up, she would get kind of like uncomfortable because her knee was hurting. And then she would move around the table and the mapping system depends on her staying in one spot. 
So we actually had, I mapped the whole entire atrium and then we had to redo it because she moved. But if you can take a look at the, I'm going to show you the, the, the bottom part of this picture. I'm just going to enlarge it a little bit here. And um, see, this is an REO view. So that's when you're looking at the side of the heart this way with the apex in this direction and uh, the base over here. So you have the right atrium is here and um, in the right lateral view, we just turn the heart a little bit and we're seeing the right atrium right here. So now let me back off on this view and show you where this spot is. So the spot that we found was indeed exactly where I expected it to be. So here's the top of the right atrium here. This is the very, this is sort of the uh, superior vena cava is coming down here. So here's the top of the right atrium. And this is the lateral wall. So you can see this person is looking that way. So it's the right atrium. So here's where the earliest signals are coming from. The red area right in here is where the earliest signals were coming from. So if you look at that um, in that blow up view, it's like right here. And that's sort of on the lateral, high lateral wall, just where we expected it to be on the lateral, lateral to the crista terminalis. And what we did was looked at the electrical signal coming from that area. And so here's um, a little bit better look of the electrical signal coming from that area. So now here, this is during the tachycardia. It was a little bit slow at this point because she was sedated. But you have this, this double bump P wave is sort of superimposed on the T wave. Here is the His region and here is the coronary sinus. And those are all relatively late because the beginning of the P wave is over here. Okay, but when we look at the catheter, the ablation catheter, look at the signals. First of all, they're really, really early. It's the earliest spot that depolarizes. It's the earliest area of activation in the heart. And then look at the signal, <clears throat> how squiggly it looks. Okay, when you have healthy myocardium, your signal is very, very sharp, and it doesn't take very long for the signal to fire. Now you've got all this stuff, it's called fractionation. And that's definitely a spot in the heart that's very, uh, very abnormal. And so what we did was we applied energy in that one area and you had this flurry of rapid beats and then nothing. And then we put a couple more burns in there. If you look at this, um, <clears throat> you can see I, I decided to, to place about three or four burns around this area, wherever I thought it was, would help. And then after the ablation, this is, this is what we had, basically a normal rhythm. So compare um, this, where you had c constant, incessant, rapid beats. That's before and that's after. Before, after, before, after. <laughs> um, so, so it was really um, a very gratifying. It took us about two hours um, because when you have an 86-year-old, you want to try to be careful. And, you know, having her wake up and go to sleep and wake up is made a little bit difficult. But, but we were able to eliminate this problem. And now her sinus rate was normal. She was running between 50 and 65 beats a minute. Um, she didn't need a pacemaker. She felt great. We discharged her off of Eliquis because she never really was at risk of a stroke because she didn't have atrial flutter or fibrillation. Uh, so it was an ideal outcome. And, but the thing is, if she had gone along with the first cardiologist's recommendation or even the second cardi cardiologist's recommendation, it wouldn't have solved the problem. I mean, she would have had a pacemaker and then she would have been taking all this antiarrhythmic medications. And what do we call those? We call them poisons with beneficial side effects. So um, it would have been a suboptimal outcome. In this case, we got right to the problem and we managed to ablate it. And it, and it was great. She went home like a, a day or two later and felt great on much less medicine. And basically the, the, the reason I, I 
show this case to you is because if you just relied on the cardiologist's interpretation of the EKG, um, you might not have recognized that, but you have to take it upon yourself to look at these tracings and study them and analyze them and, and, uh, and make the right diagnosis based on your knowledge of the electrical activity of the heart, the conduction system, and recognize this as being an ectopic atrial tachycardia, a focus that in this case was relatively easy to reach. Now, sometimes these foci are on the left side of the heart or deep in the pulmonary vein, or they may have been um, you know, hard to reach or doing a transeptal puncture to get to the left side of the heart is a little bit more risky. But in this case, it's because the P waves look so similar to the sinus node, I had a sneaking suspicion that we were dealing with an area near the crista terminalis. So keep that in mind as well, that you can actually, um, you, you can actually uh, figure out where the tachycardia is coming from. I mean, if you go online and do some Google research, you can find there are lots of articles that have been published uh, where you can look at the P wave morphology in 12 leads and get a sense of where the, where the P waves are coming from. So it's a little bit easier to assess the risk benefit ratio of doing an ablation procedure. Because if it's left-sided, it's a little bit more risky and it's a little bit harder to find it. I always say it's like looking for a needle in a haystack in some ways. It's a lot more challenging than doing like a WPW or PSVT from AV nodal reentry tachycardia. But in this case, I had a feeling it was going to be near the crista. We got to it right away. We managed to ablate it in about four burns and it was gone and it was really terrific. So um, always think what could, what could you offer this patient? And it, unless you understand the mechanism of the tachycardia, unless you truly understand the physiology behind arrhythmias, uh, you might give her bad advice. Uh, in this case, the pacemaker might have worked out, but I don't think she would have felt as well because she would have had to take high doses of antiarrhythmic medications, which we know have side effects. So um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm glad that you were able to uh, join me for this presentation. It was a lot of fun. Um, it, it really did take me like, three hours to get ready for this, but uh, I hope it was worth it for you. If you enjoy this content, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. It's ECG Doc. And if you want to learn more insights and, and get better at reading ECGs, if you want to read ECGs like an expert, uh, then check out ecgacademy.com. The link is in the description below. So uh, you can just click on it and check it out. Uh, the other thing is um, there's a uh, a website that I created known as heartrhythmcentral.com. And uh, if you want some additional information, uh, more of a general information, and, and uh, you can send your patients to take a look at it. There are a lot of really cool articles uh, that uh, I wrote that uh, give a little bit more insight into some of these more complex um, arrhythmias, but it's written in very plain language so you can understand it more easily. So uh, until next week, I, uh, I wish you well, and I thank you again for joining me at this uh, clinical live stream on a, on a gray Saturday morning here in New Jersey. And uh, until then, um, until next week, hopefully I'll be able to pull one again, uh, again uh, next week. Um, I will see you. Stay well and um, happy ECGs.